Hey everybody, and welcome to There and Back Again. I'm Alistair Stevens. Tonight, in our 56th session exploring Tolkien's Middle-earth, we look, well, at the end of the first chapter of Return of the King, because we didn't get through everything last week, of course, and we're going to launch ourselves into the second chapter, The Passing of the Grey Company. Lots and lots and lots to discuss tonight. I make no great promise that we will get through everything in the course of the next hour and a half or so, but that's okay, because next week's going to be a lighter reading, and we will have plenty of time to catch up. Hi to everyone who is joining me live. We've got Heroes and Bards and Jackie and Karen and Rachel and Becca is here and Lady Zial is joining us. A lot of conversation before the live session started about the Silmarillion and the trouble that we all have keeping up with the names in the Silmarillion. It's going to be a challenge. I'm not going to lie, you guys. Uh, there was some joking earlier about uh, about quizzes at the end of every chapter of the Silmarillion, and I'm not sure that I won't set quizzes, just fun little playful quizzes at the end of every chapter when we finally get around to reading the Silmarillion in the months to come. We'll see how that works out, shall we? So... We'll conclude our thoughts on Minas Tirith. I think I have four slides pulled from the first chapter of Return of the King, and then we're going to launch into the passing of the Grey Company. First, though, I wanted to address an email that I got this week from Tom. This is a really great email. Tom writes, The Paths of the Dead sounds like it was made for some ultra-literal but poetic-sounding Sindarin name. Instead, we only ever get the English slash Westron name for it, which I find, well, downright clunky. Any idea what the professor was thinking here? Hope to make the live session on Friday. I'm not sure if you're with us, Tom. If you are, shout out in the chat. This was a really great question because I honestly had never considered the name The Paths of the Dead, but you're absolutely right. We don't get a lovely poetic Sindarin name. In fact, I couldn't think of a lovely poetic Sindarin name for it, but it turns out that there is one. If you look at the unfinished index of The Lord of the Rings, which was never completed as the name suggests, the unfinished index was never completed and never properly published as a part of The Lord of the Rings, there is in fact a Sindarin name for The Paths of the Dead, and it is in fact completely literal. It translates directly to the Paths of the Dead, as you might expect. It is Fwi Ngorthrim. I guess that's how we're pronouncing that. Also, a little pronunciation note. I have been chastising myself of late for mispronouncing that CH sound at the end of, of Sindarin names in particular with that Scottish fricative, with that, that sound that you associate with words like loch and, and other Scottish words. And that's not entirely correct. But it turns out that it's also not entirely incorrect, because in Gondorian Sindarin, apparently it is voiced as a fricative. It is a velar fricative. So I'm just going to lean into it. And tonight when we talk about erech, we will be talking about erech and not erek or eresh, I suppose. We'll do the best that we can with it. So let's get into our discussion with uh, Minas Tirith, with Baragond, son of Baranor, and the introduction of Pippin to his first, I suppose, average level man of Gondor, right? He spent some time with Boromir, of course, and he has spent some time with Denethor now that he is sworn to his service, but this is his first introduction to a regular run-of-the-mill quotidian man of Gondor who is also just exceptional. Presently, he noticed a man, clad in black and white, coming along the narrow street from the centre of the citadel towards him. Pippin felt lonely and made up his mind to speak as the man passed, but he had no need. The man came straight up to him. "'You are Peregrine, the halfling,' he said. "'I am told you have been sworn to the service of the lord and of the, of the city. Welcome.' He held out his hand, and Pippin took it. "'I am named Baragond, son of Baranor. I have no duty this morning, and I have been sent to you to teach you the passwords, and to tell you some of the many things you will no doubt wish to know. And for my part, I would learn of you also. For never before have we seen a halfling in this land, and though we have heard rumour of them, little is said of them in any tale that we know. Moreover, you are a friend of Mithrandir. Do you know him well?' "'Well,' said Pippin, "'I have known of him all my short life, as you might say, and lately I have travelled far with him, but there is much to read in that book, and I cannot claim to have seen more than a page or two. Yet, perhaps, I know him as well as any but a few. Aragorn was the only one of our company, I think, who really knew him.' "'Aragorn,' said Baragond. "'Who is he?' "'Oh,' stammered Pippin, "'he was a man who went about with us. "'I think he is in Rohan now.' "'Pippin, doing his best to keep the secret "'which will be revealed all too soon "'that the king is, in fact, returning to Minas Tirith. "'I have <laughs> a huge fondness for Baragond, son of Baranor, "'and for his son, Burgil, "'who we will meet in just a few slides' time. "'I enjoy very much seeing this perspective of Minas Tirith, this perspective of Pippin, of halflings in general, of the great doings of the world here in the Third Age from this peculiar perspective. And as we discussed last time, to some great extent, in fact, The Return of the King is a book which modulates its its height beautifully. It is a book more so even than the other books of The Lord of the Rings, and arguably more so even here in Book 5 than in any other book in the six-book span of The Lord of the Rings, that can raise itself to the highest heights. We're going to get some pretty high heights later in tonight's reading as we look at Aragorn and Eowyn, and also descend again to the Hobbit level, which is pretty much what we do here. But by bringing this 
beautifully constructed epic edifice of Minas Tirith down to a human and manageable scale, we manage to draw the reader into Pippin's experience all the more powerfully. We have had the clean Pippin version of Minas Tirith, right? As he approaches, as they ascend through the terraces up toward the citadel, that's mostly Pippin. We, we get Pippin the Hobbit of the Shire and his perspective there, his experience there. Then, of course, when we get to Denethor, we see that ascension, right? We have that wonderful moment in the courtyard outside of the citadel where he sees the white tree of Gondor and his first thought is, wow, I could use a gardener. I, I don't understand why the folks of Minas Tirith haven't taken out that dead tree. That seems weird. And then he remembers the words of Gandalf, having recently been chastised for walking around asleep, for not paying attention and for not figuring things out. Having been chastised for that, he seems to understand more clearly that there is something of iconic or symbolic significance about the white tree. Then we enter into the citadel itself and he sees the arrayed ranks of statues, the old kings and stewards of, of Gondor, of Minas Tirith here. And then of course, when he takes his oath in front of Denethor, which we will discuss in full just a little later, he is in a very high mode indeed. He's, he's Peregrine, son of Paladin then, more than he is, is Pippin. And introducing Baragond allows us to see a similarly low perspective in a very different context, right? Baragond is just a man of Gondor. That is his whole deal. He is actually named for one of the previous, uh, one of the previous stewards of Gondor, the 20th steward of Gondor, where Denethor is the 26th steward. But uh, Baragond is just a man of Gondor, and that perspective is much more recognizably familiar, comfortable, I suppose, much more recognizably hobbitish than any other potential perspective that we could get in Minas Tirith. Denethor is not going to give us this perspective. Even Faramir would not give us this perspective. This is a, a boots-on-the-ground kind of perspective of Minas Tirith, and this gives us an entry point into, well, a great deal of foreboding, because this is when they are looking out together over the city walls after discussing some small matters of Minas Tirith and Pippin's journey. They're looking out over the, the city walls, and they see the shadow rising in the east, perhaps a cloud, perhaps a mountain, perhaps a coming darkness beyond the Anduin River toward Mordor. Berigond is concerned about the hopes for Minas Tirith, the hopes for Gondor in general at this point. And then they hear the cry of the Nazgul, this, this, this awful and terrifying force passing high above them. And this actually takes us to the aftermath of the Nazgul's flight. For a time, they sat together with bowed heads and did not speak. Then suddenly Pippin looked up and saw the sun was still shining and the banners still streaming in the breeze. He shook himself. It is past, he said. No, my heart will not yet despair. Gandalf fell and has returned and is with us. We may stand, if only on one leg, or at least be left still upon our knees. Rightly said, cried Baragon, rising and striding to and fro. Nay, though all things must come utterly to an end in time, Gondor shall not perish yet. Not though the walls be taken by a reckless foe that will build a hill of carrion before them. There are still other fastnesses and secret ways of escape into the mountains. Hope and memory shall live still in some hidden valley where the grass is green. All the same... I wish it were over for good or ill, said Pippin. I am no warrior at all and dislike any thought of battle, but waiting on the edge of one I can't escape. Uh, waiting on the edge of one I can't escape is worst of all. What a long day it seems already. I should be happier if we were not obliged to stand and watch, making no move, striking nowhere first. No stroke would, uh, would have been struck in Rohan, I think, but for Gandalf. Ah, oh, they, there you lay your finger on a sword that many feel, said Baragond. But things may change when Faramir returns. He is bold, more bold than many deem. For in these days men are slow to believe that a captain can be wise and learned in the scrolls of lore and song as he is, and yet a man of hardihood and swift judgment in the field. But such is Faramir, less reckless and eager than Boromir, but not less resolute. Yet what indeed can he do? We cannot assault the mountains of, of yonder realm. Our reach is shortened, and we cannot strike till some foe comes within it. Then our hand must be heavy. He smote the hilt of his sword. Pippin looked at him, tall and proud and noble, as all the men that he had yet seen in that land, and with a glitter in his eye he thought of the battle. Alas, my own hand feels as light as a feather, he thought, but he said nothing. A pawn, did Gandalf say? Perhaps, but on the wrong chessboard. Pippin recognizing there that dissonance between his previous experience and his imminent experience, I suppose. The story in which he thought he had found himself and the story in which he has actually found himself. This passage always stands out to me most notably for Baragon's assessment of Faramir, a wise and insightful perspective on Faramir, and yet one that is, because Baragond is simply a man of Gondor, one that is clearly intended to be emblematic of the response of the city as a whole, of Gondor as a whole. This is the first time that we have seen 
well, anyone else talk about Boromir in these terms, right? Boromir is presented to us as the most Gondorian. He is peak Gondorian. And we had a question mark kind of float over that in the last reading when we were looking at this notion that, as Gandalf asserts, Denethor possesses more of the Numenorian blood than any man yet living except perhaps Faramir, right? Boromir does not. Boromir is not clearly and cleanly of that Numenorian descent in the way that Faramir is. And when we think of that Numenorian descent, what do we think of? Well, we think of being bold, more bold than than many deem. For in these days, men are slow to believe that a captain can be wise and learned in the scrolls of lore and song as he is, and yet a man of hardihood and swift judgment in the field, but such is Faramir. Faramir embodies not just the tradition of lore and song, of diplomacy and of gentle rule that we have seen, well, not so much in Gondor, honestly, but in other parts of Middle-earth. He doesn't just embody those virtues that we associate with the Shire and with Rivendell and with the gentler lands west of the Misty Mountains. He is also possessed of this swift judgment and resolute valor in, in the field of combat. That is Faramir's reputation here in the streets of Minas Tirith. That is the, the reputation that is filtered down to a man like Baragond. That, that's his perspective on the other son of the king, I suppose. And we're inclined here to accept that freely, of course, because of our personal connection with Faramir that we saw back in the Two Towers, that, that was established so forcefully back in the Two Towers, but also because Denethor has been well, less respectful of Faramir than he ought to be. You'll remember in the last reading him calling out, you know, my son, using the singular there to describe the death of Boromir and wishing that Faramir had gone in his stead because now Minas Tirith needs Boromir, not Faramir, and Gandalf chastising him for it. We've already kind of leaned into that idea that Denethor is is misaligned in his loyalty toward his son, in his unequal love for his sons. And of course, we get the shadow, the darkness that is coming, the shadow that has lain over the distant lands to the east of, of yonder realm, as Baragon says here, catching himself in this description of Mordor. He will not use that word. And we also get the resistance. We get the triumph of hope over despair. It is past, says Pippin. No, my heart will not yet despair. Gandalf fell and has returned and is with us. We may stand if only on one leg or at least be left still upon our knees. Which is a very martial metaphor for Pippin, I think, but an entirely appropriate metaphor for Peregrine, son of Paladin. Rightly said, cried Baragon, rising and striding to and fro. That rising and striding reminds me of the injunction that Tom Bombadil lays upon the hobbits after he has rescued them from the Barrowdance, telling them to run upon the grass, right? To take physical action and to be connected to the world is to cast off the shadow of despair from your heart. And Baragond here instinctively, apparently, is leaning into that. Nay, though all things must come utterly to an end in time, Gondor shall not perish yet. Okay, let's be fatalist about this. In the end, everything's going to fall. But not today. Not, as someone might say, this day. Not though the walls be taken by a reckless foe that will build a hill of carrion before them, there are still other fastnesses and secret ways of escape into the mountains. Hope and memory shall live still in some hidden valley where the grass is green. We could leave... Minas Tirith? Like, Gondor isn't anchored in this place? Again, an interesting and novel perspective in this passage that does not connect with what Denethor has told us, does not connect really with what Gandalf has said about Gondor. All through the book to this point, we have presented Minas Tirith as the last bastion. This is going to be the battlefront. The war will be won or lost, depending on whether or not Minas Tirith stands. But Beragon sees a different alternative. He sees some hope at least of escape. And there is no hope of escape. Ultimately, I think that, that we know from our privileged position as readers of this book that there is no hope for escape, that the shadow of Mordor will fall up across all Middle-earth. And if Minas Tirith falls, if Gondor falls, then everything is going to fall. Everything will come to an end. And there is no hidden valley where the grass is green that will remain safe for very long. But in a sense, that doesn't matter. Because Beragond, while dedicated to the defense of Minas Tirith, is also... Speaking here of hope, a uh, uh, valiant hope that we can take our hits and still endure. We don't have to put all of our faith, all of our hope on the defense of Minas Tirith, that even if we are beaten here, we shall still resolutely, recklessly have hope. Let's see how that works out when we get to the Battle of Pelennor Fields. So Pippin and Baragond go about their business, they talk a little more, then they part, and Pippin ends up in the company of Bergil, son of Baragond. Greetings, said the lad. Where do you come from? You're a stranger in the city. I was, said Pippin, but they say I have become a man of Gondor. 
Oh, come, said the, land, the, said the lad, then we are all men here. But how old are you, and what is your name? I am ten years already, and shall soon be five feet. I am taller than you, but then my father is a guard, one of the tallest. What is your father? Which question shall I answer first, said Pippin. My father farms the land around Whitwell, near Tuckborough in the Shire. I am nearly twenty-nine, so I pass you there, though I am but four feet, and not likely to grow any more, save sideways. Twenty-nine, said the lad, and whistled. Why, you are quite old, as old as my uncle Yorlis. Still, he added hopefully, I wager I could stand you on your head or lay you on your back. Maybe you could if I let you, said Pippin with a laugh, and maybe I could do the same to you. We know some wrestling tricks in my little country, where, let me tell you, I am considered uncommonly large and strong, and I have never allowed anyone to stand me on my head, so if it came to a trial and nothing else would serve, I might have to kill you. For when you are older, you will learn that folk are not always what they seem. Now you have taken me as a soft stranger lad and easy prey. Let me warn you, I am not. I am a halfling, hard, bold, and wicked. Pippin pulled such a grim face that the boy stepped back a pace but at once he returned with clenched, fit, clenched fists and the light of battle in his eye. No, Pippin laughed. Don't believe what strangers say of themselves either. I am not a fighter, but I would be politer in any case for the challenger to, but it would be politer in any case for the challenger to say who he is. The boy drew himself up proudly. I am Berigal, son of Berigond of the guards, he said. So I thought, said Pippin, for you look like your father. I know him and he sent me to find you. Bergel here, Valiant Star being the direct uh, translation from Gondorian um, Cinderin there. Berigond, his father, uh, Bold Stone. You'll see at the end of Berigond, of course, the same root word as gives us Gondor, the land of stone. So, uh, so Berigond has, uh, has um, been granted that in his name too, as I say, named for the previous steward. This is a lovely interaction, and again, we're playing with perspective here. We've had the perspective of a man of the guard, one of the tallest, as Virgil tells us proudly, right? Tallness equaling greatness here in Gondorian culture, as it kind of did in Numenorian culture, too. The bigger you are, the greater you are. That seems to be pretty consistent throughout Gondorian and the sub-Numenorian cultures. But here we're getting still yet another perspective, a childlike perspective, literally a childlike perspective here from a 10 year old uh, who is already five feet tall. I am taller than you, but then my father is a guard, one of the tallest. What is your father? And we get a new perspective on Pippin. This playfulness, this competitive spirit here, this wrestling that he proposes with Burgel is Interesting. Maybe I could do the same to you. We know some wrestling tricks in my little country where, let me tell you, I am considered uncommonly large and strong, and I have never allowed anyone to stand me on my head. Is Pippin considered uncommonly large and strong? Well, no. Certainly we have no attestation here in the text that suggests that that is the case. So if it came to a trial and nothing else would serve... I might have to kill you. For when you are older, you will learn that folk are not always what they seem. And though you have taken me for a soft, stranger lad and easy prey, let me warn you, I am not. I am a halfling, hard, bold, and wicked. These are, of course, not words that we would use to, to describe hobbits at all. Hard, bold, and wicked? Well, no. Certainly not hobbits of the Shire, or not many hobbits of the Shire. Wicked? Well, we'll talk about that, of course, when we return to the Shire at the end of this volume. Um, this playfulness, this posturing from Pippin is really interesting, and to my mind, at least unprecedented in The Lord of the Rings. I don't think that we have seen hobbits take quite this stance, take quite this position, be quite so playful. But of course, Pippin isn't just a hobbit now. Now he is a man of Gondor. They say I have become a man of Gondor, which of course, technically, legally, crucially, he has. He has sworn an oath to Denethor. He is now a, well, he, reje he rejected and resented being called a man in the previous reading, of course, but he is of Gondor now. And that seems to have altered his perspective a bit. I don't want to overstate this or overread this. He is clearly playing with the child, right? He is he is responding playfully to this youth that has accosted him so and is, is so full of, of questions and curiosity. But still, he is playing with him in a way that doesn't read to me completely in accord with what we have seen from Hobbits previously, not even from Pippin previously. I like this read very, very much. Pippin is channeling Gandalf here. This is such a Gandalf thing to do, says Heroes and Bards. That's True, isn't it? That's that's a really nice interpretation here, isn't Bards? Good catch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sanitar Claus also saying, and in this corner, Belgil, son of Berigond, and in this corner, Pippin the Falcon took. Yeah, it's probably going to be an underwhelming match. I'm not sure that uh, either one of them is going to be a great warrior in this particular instance, but it would be entertaining, at least, I'm sure. Okay. Let's keep pushing on. We've got to get to the end of the reading. We see the arrival of the captain of the captains of the Outlands with the support troops for Minas Tirith against the coming battle. Uh, there are far fewer than expected, of course, because 
some force has been ravaging the Atlans, particularly those to the south. We'll probably circle around and deal with that later. We also get the brilliantly named Imrahil, Prince of Dol Amroth. More on Dol Amroth later. So few reinforcements have come to Minas Tirith, fewer certainly than are expected. Pippin returns to Gandalf's lodgings and he finds the wizard there and we conclude our chapter with the coming darkness here. The lodging was dark, save for a little lantern set on the table. Gandalf was not there. Gloom settled still more heavily on Pippin. He climbed on the bench and tried to peer out of a window, but it was like looking into a pool of ink. He got down and closed the shutter and went to bed. For a while he lay and listened for sounds of Gandalf's return, and then he fell into an, un an uneasy sleep. In the night he was wakened by a light, and he saw that Gandalf had come and was pacing to and fro in the room beyond the curtain of the alcove. There were candles on the table and rolls of parchments. He heard the wizard sigh and mutter, When will Faramir return? Hello, said Pippin, poking his head round the curtain. I thought you had forgotten all about me. I am glad to see you back. It has been a long day. But the night will be too short, said Gandalf. I have come back here, for I must have a little peace alone. You should sleep in a bed while you still may. At the sunrise, I shall take you to the Lord Denethor again. No, when the summons comes, not at sunrise. The darkness has begun. There will be no dawn. This is the dawnless day. And Gandalf here is obviously feeling the stress of all that is coming upon Minas Tirith in the days ahead. Um, let's transition into chapter two and look at the passing of the Great Company, which we're actually going to begin by looking at the timeline. I mentioned last week that the timeline was going to be a little complicated because from the end of the Two Towers, we jump back in time to start chapter one of The Return of the King, and then we jump further back in time to start chapter two. As you'll see, I, this is the uh, this is a, a, a excerpt from the timeline that I laid out for you all in last week's session, but I've added some new parts here in bold. So March 5th, the parley with Saruman, the Palantir is thrown down, Frodo and Sam arrive at Moranon, they're beholding the Black Gate and deciding this is probably not the way that we're going to get into Mordor now that you mention it. And that is where we begin chapter two of book five. So that's on March 5th. On March 8th, Frodo, Sam, and Gollum leave Henethanun for the crossroads. That's the beginning of chapter one. That's where we meet Pippin and Gandalf riding uh, up to Minas Tirith. Aragorn, or, or actually kind of crossing uh, crossing the, the the wilds to the northwest of, uh, of Minas Tirith. That is when Aragorn takes to the Paths of the Dead. That's March 8th. Then on March 9th, Gandalf and Pippin reach Minas Tirith. Frodo and Sam reach the Morgul Road, and Aragorn departs from Erech. That is the end of this week's reading, which we may not even get to this week. So now you can see how this complicated timeline is beginning to take shape. We conclude the two towers, we jump back for the first chapter of The Return of the King, then we jump back further still to begin the second chapter of The Return of the King, The Passing of the Grey Company, which begins with some ominous words. Gandalf was gone, and the thudding hooves of Shadowfax were lost in the night when Merry came back to Aragorn. He had only a light bundle, for he had lost his pack at Parth Gallon, and all he had was a few useful things he had picked up among the wreckage of Isengard. Hasafel was already saddled. Legolas and Gimli with their horse stood close by. So four of the company still remain, said Aragorn. We will ride on together, but we shall not go alone as I thought. The king is now determined to set out at once. Since the coming of the winged shadow, he desires to return to the hills under cover of night. And then whither, said Legolas. I cannot say yet, Aragorn answered. As for the king, he will go to the muster that he commanded at Edoras four nights from now. And there I think he will hear tidings of war, and the riders of Rohan will go down to Minas Tirith. But for myself, and any that will go with me, I for one, cried Legolas, and Gimli with him, said the dwarf. Well, for myself, said Aragorn. It is dark before me. I must go down also to Minas Tirith, but I do not yet see the road. An hour long prepared approaches. Do not leave me behind, said Mary. I have not been of much use yet, but I don't want to be laid aside like baggage to be called for when all is over. I don't think the riders will want to be bothered with me now, though, of course, the king did say I was to sit by him when he came to his house and tell him about the shire. Yes, said Aragorn, and your road lies with him, I think, Mary. But do not look for mirth at the ending. It will be long, I fear, ere Theoden sits at ease again in Methuseld. Many hopes will wither in this bitter spring. So Gandalf and Pippin have departed, and now the rest of the force that, that well, didn't take Isengard, I suppose, sealed the fate of Isengard. The rest of the, the, the riders of Rohan must decide their fate. King Theoden is going to take the bulk of the riders and is going to go to the muster of Rohan, where they are going to assemble their massed force to come down to Minas Tirith to the aid of Gondor against the coming foe. And Aragorn has to decide his path. He has to figure out where he is supposed to go. He cannot yet determine or discern the right course of action. This is going to be a challenge for him. And this is somewhat akin to the Aragorn that we saw at the beginning of the Two Towers, right? Riven by a kind of indecision and a kind of regret. It is not yet clear the path that he should take, but it will, in short order, become clear. 
the Dunedain come. We meet Harborad, who has brought 30 men south in response to the summons that we will later figure out has been sent by Galadriel to Rivendell, plus the brothers Elrohir and Eladan, the sons of Elrond, the elder brothers of Arwen. And though it isn't explicit anywhere in Tolkien's text, it is thought that Elrohir and Eladan are actually twins, that they are the twin sons of Elrond. We get uh, we get this quote when we were actually introduced to them. Presently, Eomer came out from the gate, and with him was Aragorn and Harborad bearing the great staff close furled in black and two tall men, neither young nor old. So much alike were they, the sons of Elrond, that few could tell them apart, dark-haired, grey-eyed, and their faces elven fair, clad alike in bright male beneath cloaks of silver grey. They were also, we know from extra-textual references, born in the same year. So it does seem likely that Elrohir and Eladon, the sons of Elrond, are actually twins, which is a really nice detail. That black staff that Habarad is carrying, too, is the banner that was woven by Arwen. We're going to, uh, well, we're going to get... A <laughs> feigned reveal of that right at the end of this chapter, and then it is going to be a signifier of the greatest moment of you catastrophe in all of Tolkien in just a few chapters' time. So let's play, pay some close attention to that banner when we get there. Becca asking, uh, do elf twins have special powers? Um, no, no, I don't think so. Certainly not that we get attested to in this book, but who knows? You know what? If you want to make up some special elf twin powers, then by all means do so. That's just a, a fan fiction work that we can all undertake together. <laughs> Ah, oh, good. Joseph pointing out the only power to uh, only power to mess with Elrond, a la Fred and George. Yeah, basically, basically, Elrond here and Eladon are the Fred and George Weasley of of Tolkien's Legendarium. I think there are way too many similarities to overlook. Absolutely good. <laughs> So there we get, <coughs> excuse me, there we get uh, our messages from the north. We get our uh, beat here. I suppose before we get to this, that we should talk a little about the message that has been sent north, the coming of the Grey Company south, the coming of the Dunedain under the uh, leadership of Halbarad of the Dunedain and the elf twins also. Um, 30 men have come south, and this is one of the very few instances that we get of any kind of number at all associated with the Dunedain. This is the number upon which we can speculate about the population of the Dunedain in the north. There aren't many of them. Apparently, there aren't many of them. Now, we must remember that this message was sent from Galadriel to Elrond at Rivendell, and he then went out and, and found uh, found Halbarad, and, and he dispatched the force south, and they came with all haste. They came with a great deal of haste, in fact, south to meet Aragorn at this point. So it is possible that 30 was the total number of, of men at arms, of, of skilled warriors, that they could marshal within a very narrow frame of time, but... It does seem as though the population of the Dunedain is not that great. It doesn't seem as though there are that many of them up there. Halbrad is a really great character. We don't get much of him, and I haven't pulled much from him in tonight's reading, but he's, he's a pretty great character, as it turns out. So these are the messages that have come down from the north. Then the riders set out again, and Aragorn for a while rode with the Dunedain. And when they had spoken of tidings in the north and in the south, Elrohir said to him, I bring word to you from my father. The days are short. If thou art in haste, remember the paths of the dead." Always, my days have seemed to me too short to achieve my desire, answered Aragorn. But great indeed will be my haste ere I take that road. That will soon be seen, said Elrohir. But let us speak no more of these things upon the open road. And Aragorn said to Halbarad, What is that you bear, kinsman? For he saw that instead of a spear he bore a tall staff, as if it were a standard, but it was, a cl but it was close furled in a black cloth bound with many thongs. It is a gift I bring to you from the Lady of Rivendell, answered Halbarad. She wrought it in secret, and long was the making. But she also sends words to you. The days now are short. Either our hope cometh or all hopes end. Therefore I send thee what I have made for thee. Farewell, Elfstone. And Aragorn said, Now I know what you bear. Bear it still for me for a while. And he turned and looked away to the north under the great stars, and then he fell silent and spoke no more while the night's journey lasted. Grim foreboding. The days are short, echoed there by Elrond and by Arwen. The days are short. If thou art in haste, remember the paths of the dead, says Elrond. Um... Just wanted to give you a nudge if things aren't working out terribly well down there in Rohan. Hey, remember the paths of the dead. It's always an option. It's all, you know, just, you can set it in your GPS. You know, Siri will guide you there. It'll all be fine. And then the message from Arwen too. The days now are short. Either our hope cometh or all hopes end. Therefore I send thee what I have made for thee. Farewell, Elfstone. Therefore I send thee what I have made for thee. Either our hope cometh or all hopes end. Either we triumph, either we get what it is that we hope for, or all hope is done, and we are left with naught but despair. Therefore, because this is the most dire of exigencies, I send to you the thing that I have made for you. Farewell, Elfstone. It's really rather lovely, and as I say, we'll get a beat right at the end about the, uh, about the banner. 
uh, right at the end of, of tonight's reading or at the end of this chapter, probably not tonight's reading, but we will get a beat right at the end of this chapter about the banner, which is a great uh, tease, uh, a reveal that in no way reveals, and then it will be ultimately revealed for us when we get to the battle sequence later. Yes. Um, let me see here. <laughs> Glow and Sun saying, one time Apple Maps led me to the paths of the dead. Yeah, pretty, pretty bad place to wind up. I mean, it is a shortcut. Like, you can't argue that it's a shortcut. In fact, now would be as good a time as any. Can I do this elegantly? I guess I can. Look at that. Hey, you guys, it's lotrproject.com. Um, I wanted to show you the map here so that we can get a rough sense of what is going on. So we begin here in the northwest. Right there in the northwest, under the menu, you can see Isengard and the Vale of Nan Kudanir. You can see the Fords of Isen to the south. You can see Helm's Deep to the southeast east of there, then the Westfold coming down the flank of the mountains there to Edoras across the river Snowborn. Directly south of Edoras, on the other side of the mountains, you can see Erech right there in the Vale by the uh, river Morthond there. Then all the way in the southeast, if you can track all the way down to the, the curve and hook of the Anduin there, you can see Pelargir, which is going to be... Um, which is going to be terribly significant in the pages to come. It's actually name checked in this chapter, but is going to be terribly significant in the cha in the chapters to come. You can also see there uh, far to the east across the uh, the bounds of Anorian there, Minas Tirith, Osgiliath, Minas Morgul, and all the way east to Rodruin there on the plateau of Gorgoroth and ultimately Barad-dûr, the Dark Tower. So this is the shape of things here. We are going to get right now Theoden and the riders of Rohan. Well, I guess not just yet. We've got a little bit of business to take care of first, but any minute now, Theoden and the riders of Rohan are going to set out by secret paths through the foothills of the mountains to return to the muster point near Edoras. Uh, Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli are not going to take those secret paths. They are instead just going to dash hell for leather across the plains because they need to get back to Edoras faster. That is a tactical decision that is made by the riders of Rohan, of course, to deflect the all-seeing eye of Saruman, which isn't really all-seeing, turns out, can quite easily be foiled. And I was just thinking about this the other day. For all that the Eye of Sauron is represented as this, this great and potent force in Middle-earth, it's not actually that powerful, right? It doesn't actually manage to discern that much. And when it does discern something in the pages to come before we get to the end of tonight's reading, it's because Aragorn wants it to. Well, more on that when we get to the Palantir. So, as I say, there you can see uh, Edoras there, just uh, to the, the south of the Snowborn, and on the other side of the mountains, Erech, where we will end this chapter. So those are the messages from the north. Let's move into Pippin, uh, into Mary, excuse me. Uh, yes, <laughs> Jackie's saying the eye is very easily distracted. Squirrel! Yeah, basically, basically. And Aragorn is about to present it with one hell of a squirrel. Yeah. Let's move into Mary giving his oath. I'm going to read this and then we're going to actually do a little compare and contrast on Mary's oath and Pippin's oath from last time. I did spend longer in the last session discussing Pippin's oath than I had planned to, so we'll skim it a little bit. As I say, we've still got a lot of material to cover this evening, so uh, bear with me as we move through this. The king was already there, and as soon as they entered, he called for Mary and had a seat set for him at his side. It is not as I would have it, said Theoden, for this is little like my fair house in Edoras, and your friend is gone who should also be here. But it may be long ere we sit, you and I, at the high table in Methuseld. There will be no time for feasting when I return thither. But come now, eat and drink, and let us speak together while we may, and then you shall ride with me. May I? said Mary, surprised and delighted. That would be splendid. He had never felt more grateful for any kindness in words. I'm afraid I'm only in everybody's way, he stammered, but I should like to do anything I could, you know. I doubt it not, said the king. I have had a good hill pony made ready for you. He will bear you as swift as any horse by the roads that we shall take. For I will ride from the burg by mountain paths, not by the plain, and so come to Edoras by way of Dunharrow, where the Lady Eowyn awaits me. You shall be my esquire, if you will. Is there gear of war in this place, Eomar, that my sword thane could use? There are no great weapon hordes here, lord, answered Eomar. Maybe a light helm might be found to fit him, but we have no mail or sword for one of his stature. I have a sword, said Mary, climbing from his seat and drawing from its black sheath his small, bright blade. Filled suddenly with love for this old man, he knelt on one knee and took his hand and kissed it. "'May I lay the sword of Mariadic of the Shire on your lap, Theoden King?' he cried. "'Receive my service, if you will!' "'Gladly will I take it,' said the king, and laying his long old hands upon the brown hair of the hobbit, he blessed him. "'Rise now, Mariadoc, esquire of Rohan of the household of Methuseld, he said. "'Take your sword and bear it unto good fortune.' "'As a father you shall be to me,' said Mary. "'For a little while,' said Theoden." I guess we're going to talk about the oath in just a second. So before we get to that, let's skip ahead right to the very end of this reading. For a little while, said Theoden. It is easy, I think, to interpret that as... Well, we can interpret that 
kind of positively, semi-positively, pseudo-positively as an acknowledgement of a kind of uh, fatalistic understanding that all things shall pass for a little while. I shall be as a father to you, not bonded by blood in exactly that way, but something akin to that, something not unlike that, for a little while. We can also, though, interpret this as foreshadowing of an event that will occur in the very next chapter that absolutely bespeaks the great and noble wisdom of Theoden King here. He knows that, spoilers for the rest of the readings, I suppose, he knows that he is going to set aside Mary's oath. He knows that he is not taking Mary with him into battle. He is going to have Mariatic ride with him now as his esquire. He is going to, to have his sword thane by his side, a kind of uh, a personal servant, a position of great honor in, in medieval cultures, of course, that he's going to have Mary by his side as an esquire as they, as they ride out from Helm's Deep back to Edoras or back to the muster point near Edoras at Dunharrow, but that Mary is not built for battle. There is an implicit limit here to the reciprocal feudalistic relationship that we see between Theoden and Mary in a way that there absolutely is not between Pippin and Denethor. Let's contrast those two those two uh, oaths here. So this is Mary's again. I'll read this again just so we can contrast it more directly with Pippin's. I have a sword, said Mary, climbing from his seat and drawing from its black sheath a small bright blade. Filled suddenly with love for this old man, he knelt on one knee and took his hand and kissed it. May I lay the sword of Mary Attic of the Shire on your lap, Theoden King, he cried. Receive my service, if you will. Gladly will I take it, said the king, and laying his long old hands upon the brown hair of the hobbit, he blessed him. Rise now, Mary Attic, esquire of Rohan of the house of Methuzel, he said. Take your sword and bear it unto good fortune. That's Mary's oath. Pippin's oath, as you'll remember from last week. The old man laid the sword along his lap, and Pippin put his hand to the hilt, and said slowly after Denethor, Here do I swear fealty and service to Gondor, and to the lord and steward of the realm, to speak and to be silent, to do and to let be, to come and to go, in need or plenty, in peace or war, in living or dying, from this hour henceforth until my lord release me, or death take me, or the world end. So say I, Peregrine, son of Paladin of the Shire of the Halflings. And this do I hear. Denethor, son of Ixthelion, lord of Gondor, steward of the High King. And I will not forget it, nor fail to reward that which is given, fealty with love, valor with honor, oath-breaking with vengeance. Then Pippin received back his sword and put it in his sheath. So what are the differences between Mary's oath and Pippin's oath? These two events occur too spontaneously and too closely together in the frame of this text for us to ignore the powerful symbolism, the, the reflective symbolism between the two, the connection between the two, right? There is an echo here between Pippin and Mary, but the differences are absolutely striking. Pippin, in the first place, recites the words that Denethor gives him. He said slowly after Denethor, here do I swear fealty and service to Gondor, right? He is repeating a formal oath that is presented for him by Denethor. His intent, as we discussed last time, I think, is largely pure. Last time, I placed the... <sighs> the motivation for Pippin's desire to take this oath, to pledge himself to the service of Denethor on basic hobbitish decency, right? That this is, in a sense, the right thing to do, that he is obligated by the death of Boromir to serve this man, to serve this man who has lost his sons, his, his, his beloved to the point of being only son so recently, that that is just an obligation that Pippin is, is rising to meet, but there are other elements associated with Pippin's decision too, including that that stern word from Gandalf, right? When, when Pippin is surprised to discover that Ara wait, Aragorn's the king? How the hell did that happen? Why does no one tell me anything? And Gandalf says, you know, if you have been, if you've been walking around asleep, then now is the time to wake up. And then we get that second beat with the white tree where Gandalf's words echo in his head as he's looking at the white tree and wondering why the gardeners haven't taken care of it. Those words echo again and he kind of, his, his perspective is raised, it is elevated. And then we move into the citadel and we get the giving of the oath. Mary's experience is very different in a way. He's not caught between the low world and the high in exactly the same way, right? He has not been swept up in events as great and as pressing and as urgent as Pippin has. Pippin has literally been swept up onto Shadowfax. He is, is riding with a legend upon a legend to a legend, right? This is Pippin's experience now. And Mary isn't quite there. Mary's having a 
smaller experience. Mary's concern is that he doesn't want to be left behind like baggage. He wants to help. He wants to pitch in. Is there anything that I could do? Riding with the king excites him because he doesn't want to be left behind and he doesn't want to be an inconvenience. He wants to serve in some measure. There is a spark of heroism within the heart of this particular hobbit. And the words that he gives to Theoden at this moment are completely spontaneous. May I lay the sword of Mariadic of the Shira on your lap, Theoden king, he cried. Receive my service if you will. Gladly will I take it, said the king. He just receives it. And, and take there, um, take is, is much less formal, right? It's much more immediate. It is much more personally transactive than it is formally transactive, as Denethor's uh, taking of, of the oath is. Um, oh, Chris also has a white tree tattoo. That's wonderful. Good. Oh, he's Chris uh, is planning a white tree tattoo for this summer. Yes, Lady Zial, as we discussed last time, uh, already uh, already possessed of a white tree tattoo. I think that's what we should all do for the end of there and back again, right? We should all just, like the, uh, like the cast of the Peter Jackson adaptation, all got those similar tattoos. We should all just, I think, uh, lean into that and get white tree tattoos. Yes. <laughs> Good. Yes. And Jackie calling out here, a king is like a father to his people in a way. Mary is taking his place among the Rohirrim as Theoden subjects, as, as Theoden's subject. Yes. Though look at the context of these oath givings and, and oath receivings, I suppose, right? This moment of spontaneity from Mary is met with enormous kindness. Gladly will I take it, said the king. Rise now, Mariatic, Esquire of Rohan of the House of Methazel. Take your sword and bear it unto good fortune. That's what Theoden says. Contrast that with Denethor. I will not forget it, nor fail, fail to reward that which is given. Fealty with love, valor with honor, oath-breaking with vengeance. Theoden doesn't say, great, Mary, awesome, glad to have you on the team. Uh, go see HR. We'll get all your paperwork taken care of. We'll, we'll get you the orientation. It'll, you know, it's a busy day. We've got the mustering of Rohan to get to. But, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that you know where the bathrooms are and the fire escapes and all of that good stuff. Um, also, I will reward oath-breaking with vengeance, just so you know. There's none of that from Theoden. Theoden is kindly and kingly in a way that Denethor is not. And again, let's remember the context, right? Theoden immediately, potentially, interpretively, pivots to this, yeah, for a while. As a father you shall be to me, said Mary, for a little while, said Theoden. To my mind, acknowledging the prospect that he has no intention of taking Mary into conflict and into battle. His intent is to leave Mary with Eowyn, to leave Mary at Edoras, to leave Mary with the other folk who are not capable of fighting here in Rohan at this time. He wants to protect Mary in this way. Denethor has no interest in protecting Pippin, right? Firstly, Pippin is immediately sent off to the guard. Yeah, no, you're going to go and learn to fight, which is not a... Not a stark qualitative difference, I suppose. There is a difference here between the men of Rohan and the men of Gondor. But remember, Denethor's initial purpose in taking Pippin's oath is not even about Pippin's service. It is so that he can coerce the truth from Pippin. So that he, the first thing that he does after receiving Pippin's oath is say, okay, speak, tell me everything. And even that isn't straightforward. Even that isn't a simple desire for information. He's not acting in a kingly way here because if he was acting in a kingly way and what he really wanted was knowledge, if what he wanted was information so that he could, I misused the word kingly there, I suppose, a stewardly way. If what he wanted was additional information so that he could make better choices in the service of Gondor, as Gandalf points out to him, He's sitting right there. Gandalf is sitting right there and knows vastly more about what is going on than Pippin does. And yet Denethor spends an hour talking to Pippin because it's about Boromir. Pippin's oath to Denethor is singular, and this is a loaded word, and I'm kind of using this with, with hesitance and reluctance, but it also seems to be the best word. It is selfish on the part of Denethor in a way that Theoden's response to Mary's is, well, anything but. The gentleness and the kindness and the spontaneity, the truth and power of it are that much more resonant than Pippin's pledge to Denethor. And this is not in any way to put a shadow over Pippin here or his desire to pledge his service to Denethor. As I said last time, I still think that springs from a very decent and dignified and, and valiant place within Pippin's character specifically and the Hobbit character in general. And absolutely, we see a reflection of that in Mary too. Mary doesn't just want to avoid being trouble or avoid being left behind or avoid being an inconvenience. He's also valiant here, right? He is excited to be riding with the king. He is surprised and delighted to be riding with the king on this little hill pony that has been tasked for the 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 uh, the passage of one Mary Attic. You know, this is 
every bit as spontaneous and every bit as authentic. The difference here is the way that it is received by Theoden on the one hand and Denethor on the other. And of course, we're going to have plenty of opportunity to look at how these points break down. Yeah. Jackie says, Theoden is secure in his authority. He was born to it. He was, at least I think according to Tolkien, divinely appointed. Denethor is not secure. He could be usurped at any time by the true king or overthrown by the enemy on his doorstep. Yeah, you're pulling a couple of important words there, Jackie. But yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, divinely appointed? Absolutely, right? Not explicitly within the frame of the Lord of the Rings, but that is clearly a part of the medieval worldview. It is clearly a part of the feudalistic worldview and clearly by inference a part of Tolkien's worldview too. Yes, kings are just special. If you are the king, it is because you were appointed. It is because you are meant to be. You are the rightful owner of, of this kingdom. You are representative of the kingdom in a profound way. And you're absolutely right, Jackie. Theoden is king. He has... Well, I suppose this is the other point of difference between Theoden and Denethor, right? Theoden has come through his darkness. We cast out his darkness back at Methuseld when Gandalf first visited him, right? You remember the, the sequence where he, he takes Theoden outside. It is not yet so dark, right? That is a wonderful sequence, and Theoden has passed through the darkness and has found his strength again. Denethor has not. We'll see how that shakes out for Denethor in due course, yeah. The other word there that's really interesting is uh, is usurped, Jackie. Yeah. He could be usurped at any time by the true king or overthrown by the enemy, his, uh, the enemy on his doorstep. This is indicative of Denethor's fundamental flaw, I think. Because you're right, that is how he sees it, right? The king could return, theoretically, at any moment. Like, it would be bad if Gondor fell. That would be a terrible thing. But also the king could come back and then I'm just not the steward anymore. And that would kind of suck for me personally too. That is a betrayal of the duty of the steward. The steward is a pair of safe hands to hold the authority of the king in the king's absence. And Denethor is failing in that desire. Angela asked a question last week about, uh, about Denethor's corruption and his desire for power. Well, hey, it's no surprise that the blood of Numenor runs so strong in him, right? The Numenorian blood, kind of a double-edged sword. It doesn't always turn to goodness and, and valor and virtue the way that it does in the body of Aragorn, for example, right? Numenorian blood also ran in the veins of Arpharazon before he launched the assault on Valinor and cracked the world as a result, or, or caused the cracking of the world as a result. So Numenorian blood, kind of a double-edged sword. Numenorian pride, absolutely a double-edged sword. More on Denethor later. I am already over halfway through time. This is terrible. Okay, um... I want to find the quote that, uh, yes, Joseph says, and yet Denethor arguably treats Pippin's oath with more respect than Theoden does Mary's. This is something that I was thinking about. It is, I, I don't want to overstate it, right? I don't want to come away from this discussion thinking Theoden is the best king in Middle-earth and Denethor is terrible. He's a villain. He's, he's like Saruman at this point. That's not true. That's absolutely not true. And we must, of course, observe and honor the difference between Rohan and Gondor. We must honor the difference between Minas Tirith on the one hand and Edoras on the other, or, or Helm's Deep, as it may be, on the other. The writers of Rohan, the, the folk of the, the Mark, are simply less formal than the men of Gondor. They put less value in that kind of history. And remember, this is introduced to us right back when we meet the writers of Rohan in the very first instance, right? We're told that they have basically no memory. There are basically no songs still sung. They've been here 500 years, 500 years, the blink of an eye in the Middle Earth timeline, 500 years. And they remember basically nothing, like basically nothing. They have no history. They exist in the perpetual present in a way that the men of Gondor absolutely do not, particularly the stewards of Gondor, right? To be a steward, the 26th steward in a line of stewards is to be constantly reminded of millennia of history and to feel the weight of that history upon you. So Denethor is the focal point of a established and complex and enormously significant and weighty history of man. Also, you know, the, the difference in their inheritance there too, right? Gondor is the last outpost of Numenor. Rohan is just some guys who came down from the north to help Gondor out in a fight 500 years ago. That was it. Errol the Young just, just took a bunch of dudes south. You know, they rode past Mirkwood and they came down to the, the gap of Rohan and helped out the Gondorians and were, uh, were told, yeah, this can be your kingdom now. And it's not like anyone's using it. All right, go nuts. Uh, it's fine. Isengard's over there. You probably want to steer clear of that one. But apart from that, go crazy. You, you nutty horse guys. There's a stark difference in the tone and the texture of kingship because there is a stark difference in the tone and the texture of, of nationhood, of identity at, at a very, very fundamental level here. The spontaneous declaration by Mary and the extemporaneous receipt of that, like, gladly will I take it, said the king. Rise now, Mariatic, Esquire of Rohan of the household of Medesouth. Take your sword and bear it unto good fortune. 
How much of that sounds to you like a formal piece of language? How much of that is the formal expected response to the swearing of an oath? Do the writers of Rohan swear oaths to their king in the same way as the men of Gondor swear oaths to theirs? Well, maybe. We just don't have enough information to speculate about that. Rise now, Mariatic, Esquire of Rohan of the household of Methazelt. Okay, that feel, rise now does feel like it may be formal language. Take your sword and bear it unto good fortune, right? Also, you'll note the autonomy that uh, Theoden gives Mary in that moment. Take your sword and bear it unto good fortune is saying, yeah, you're in my service. Go be great. Go, go just do great and valiant things in my service. That's fantastic. It's not bounded the same way that Denethor is bounding Pippin. Again, let's not be too stern about Denethor at this point. We will have the opportunity to be stern and judgmental about Denethor in the chapters to come, but not now. I think that recognizing the formal structures of Gondor does give us a better insight into the, the way that these uh, oaths are treated. And of course, this is just the giving of the oath. We will see how these oaths play out in due course. All right, let us get back to uh, to Aragorn and to the paths of the dead. Um, excellent. <laughs> Aragorn was silent for a moment. Three days, he murmured and the muster of Rohan will only have begun. But I see now that it cannot be hastened. He looked up, and it seemed that he had made some decision. His face was less troubled. Then by your leave, Lord, I must take new counsel for myself and my kindred. We must ride our own road, and no longer in secret. For me the time of stealth has passed. I will ride east by the swiftest way, and I will take the paths of the dead. The paths of the dead, said Theoden, and trembled. Why do you speak of them? Aylmer turned and gazed at Aragorn, and it seemed to Mary that the faces of the riders that sat within hearing turned pale at the words. If there be in truth such paths, said Theoden, their gate is in Dunharrow, but no living man may pass it. Alas, Aragorn, my friend, said Aomer, I had hoped that we would ride to war together, but if you seek the paths of the dead, then our parting is come, and it is little likely that we shall ever meet again under the sun. That road I will take nonetheless, said Aragorn, but I say to you, Aomer, that in battle we may yet meet again, though all the hosts of Mordor should stand between. You will do as you will, my lord Aragorn, said Theoden. It is your doom, maybe, to tread strange paths that others dare not. This parting grieves me, but my strength is le and my strength is lessened by it. But now I must take the mountain roads and delay no longer. Farewell. Farewell, Lord, said Aragorn. Ride unto great renown. Farewell, Mary. I leave you in good hands, better than we hoped when we had hunted the orcs to Fangorn. Legolas and Gimli will still hunt with me, I hope, but we shall not forget you. Goodbye, said Mary. He could find no more to say. He felt very small, and he was puzzled and depressed by all these gloomy words. More than ever, he missed the unquenchable cheerfulness of Pippin. The riders were ready, and their horses were fidgeting. He wished they would start and get it over. As he's thinking of the unquenchable cheerfulness of Pippin there, he's unconsciously echoing the words of Pippin back there on the ramparts of Minas Tirith when Pippin finds himself on the, the edge of a battle that he knows is coming and that he just wants it to hurry up. He just wants it to be done already for good or for ill. Mary here absolutely echoing the thoughts of, of Pippin there. So Aragorn is going to take his own path. He is going to take the paths of the dead. He's going to ride out to Edoras. He's going to ride to Dunharrow. He is going to take the paths of the dead, whatever that may mean, and thence into adventure and into myth and into legend. But you'll note here, too, another moment of prophecy from Aragorn. And this is signified by one of those poetic phrases that we see in The Lord of the Rings. But I say to you, Eomer, that in battle we may yet meet again, though all the hosts of Mordor shall stand between. Something arises within Aragorn in that moment, right? The paths of the dead are bad news. The paths of the dead, said Theoden, and trembled. Why do you speak of them? Everyone is turning pale. These hale and hearty men of the mark are turning pale at the mention of the paths of the dead? This is serious business. This is the most serious of business. Their gate is in Dunharrow, but no living man may pass it. And then Aomer cries out, Alas, Aragorn, my friend, I had hoped that we should ride to war together, but if you seek the paths of the dead, then our parting is come, and it is little likely that we shall ever meet again under the sun. That road I will take nonetheless, says Aragorn. Kind of conceding the point, right? The nonetheless there is saying, yes, Aomer, yeah, you know what? Probably. You, you might be right. I had hoped, too, that we would ride to battle together, but doesn't look good, does it? Uh, that road I will take nonetheless, said Aragorn, conceding the point. But I say to you, Aomer, that in battle we may yet meet again, though all the hosts of Mordor should stand between. Minor spoilers for the rest of the Return of the King, you guys. They will indeed meet in battle again. This is one, And, and when they do, Aragorn is going to call it out. He's going to say, hey, it's like that prophecy I made that time. Do you remember? Wasn't that cool? Well, here we are. Guess I know what I'm talking about from time to time. Aragorn is possessed of that kingly sight that we've discussed now so many times through the pages of The Lord of the Rings. There are so many moments when he has... This awareness of the shape of the story in which he's in, like, not 
not even necessarily, I think, a kind of um, an awareness of the echo of the music, the way that Elrond might or Gandalf might, you know, we've speculated about that before too, that that the echo of the, the template for the entire history of the world kind of resonating within him. It doesn't seem as though he quite has that because he will pivot out. This is no, if I understand right, all that I have heard from Elrond. This is something very different. He's, he concedes the point that road I will take nonetheless, but I say to you, Aomer, but I say to you, Aomer, watch as I shift into prophetic mode here. Watch as my, my, rhetoric, st uh, my rhetoric increases in dimensionality and skill here. But I say to you, Aomer, that in battle we may yet meet again, though all the hosts of Mordor should stand between. And that's it. That's our leave taking here. Farewell, Lord, said Aragorn, ride unto great renown. Farewell, Mary. I leave you in good hands, better than we hoped when we hunted the orcs to, Fang to Fangorn. The parting of the fellowship. The fellowship broken again once more. The last kind of, in a sense, because of the disassociation of the Hobbit, this always feels to me like the last breaking of the fellowship, right? Because... Now there is no single thread of continuity that carries us back to the Shire. There's no single thread of continuity that carries us back to Bree, even, right? Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli together since the Council of Elrond, maybe. I mean, I know that's when the Fellowship is formed. Like, I understand that that's the, the point of transition there, but there is now no connection between all of the doughty hobbits that, that left the Shire behind, besides Frodo and Sam, of course. But even Frodo and Sam, you'll remember at this point in the story, are parted. Frodo has been taken by the enemy and Sam is left alone. All four of the hobbits at this point in time, alone. Well, I suppose not technically at this point in time, if we're looking at the date, but at this point in the narrative, all four hobbits alone now and unaided. So that's the uh, introduction of the Paths of the Dead and of Aragorn's prophecy. And Aragorn spends some time away. He spends some time all by himself. He spends some time in the highest tower of the Berg, just kind of, just kind of chilling, just kind of, you know, thinking his Aragorn thoughts, thinking how good it is to be the king. And then we get the uh, conversation with Gimli and Legolas about looking in the Palantir. A struggle somewhat grimmer for my part than the Battle of the Hornburg, answered Aragorn. I have looked in the stone of Orthanc, my friends. You've looked in at the cursed stone of wizardry, exclaimed Gimli with fear and astonishment in his face. Did you say aught to him? Even Gandalf feared that encounter. You forget to whom you speak, said Aragorn sternly, and his eyes glinted. What do you fear that I should say to him? Did I not openly proclaim my title before the doors of Edoras? Nay, Gimli, he said in a softer voice, and the grimness left his face, and he looked like one who has labored in sleepless pain for many nights. Nay, my friends... I am the lawful master of the stone, and I had both the right and the strength to use it, or so I judged. The right cannot be doubted. The strength was enough. Barely. He drew a deep breath. It was a bitter struggle, and the weariness is slow to pass. I spoke no word to him, and in the end I wrenched the stone to my own will. That alone he will find hard to endure, and he beheld me. Yes, Master Gimli, he saw me, but in other guise than you see me here. If that will aid him, then I have done ill, but I do not think so. To know that I lived and walked the earth was a blow to his heart, I deem, for he knew it not till now. The eyes in Orthanc did not see through the armor of Theoden, but Sauron has not forgotten Isildur and the sword of Elendil. Now in the very hour of his great designs, the heir of Isildur and the sword are revealed, for I showed the blade reforged to him. He is not so mighty yet that he is above fear. Nay, doubt ever gnaws him. But he wields great dominion nonetheless, said Gimli, and now he will strike more swiftly. The hasty stroke goes off to stray, said Aragorn. We must press our enemy and no longer wait upon him for the move. See, my friends, when I had mastered the stone, I learned many things. A grave peril I saw coming unlooked for upon Gondor from the south that will draw off great strength from the defense of Minas Tirith. If it is not countered swiftly, I deem that the city will be lost ere ten days be gone. Then lost it must be, said Gimli. For what help is there to send thither, and how could it come there in time? I have no help to send, therefore I must go myself, said Aragorn. But there is only one way through the mountains that will bring me to the coastlands before all is lost. That is the paths of the dead. There is so much here that we could easily spend the next half hour talking about it. Honestly, we could spend the rest of the session talking about this and might. In fact, I would really like to get to Aragorn and uh, Eowyn tonight, but that now seems unlikely. Let's look very carefully at this passage. This is... Huge. So Aragorn has taken the Palantir from Orthanc, the stone of Orthanc, and last night he gazed into it, knowing what would happen, knowing that it was a direct line to Barad-dûr, that it was a direct connection to Sauron himself, a connection that, as Gimli points out, Gandalf was fearful of. Aragorn has willingly taken on that challenge and has risen to beat it. 
I have looked in the stone of Orthanc, my friends. You've looked in that accursed stone of wizardry, exclaimed Gimli with fear and astonishment in his face. Did you say aught to him? Even Gandalf feared that encounter. You forget to whom you speak, said Aragorn sternly, and his eyes glinted. What do you fear that I should say to him? Did I not openly proclaim my title before the doors of Edoras? Nay, Gimli, nay, my friends. He comes back to himself from a moment of heightened emotion. You forget to whom you speak. We haven't heard Aragorn say anything like that. And I have to say, that's the line in the second edition of The Lord of the Rings. That's the line in, in the edition that I'm sure all of us are reading. I doubt any of us are reading the first, uh, the first edition of the British printing of The Lord of the Rings. But in that first edition, the line was even more stern. In the first edition, Aragorn says to Gimli, what do you fear that I should say? That I have a rascal of a rebel dwarf here that I would gladly exchange for a serviceable orc? I mean, damn, Aragorn, I, I, I get it. You're in kingly mode right now, but... Okay, it's it's just Gimli. He's just, you know, he's concerned about such things. He's concerned about such, you know, fell wizardry and, and accursed things. But yeah, pretty stern. This, though, is Aragorn uncloaked. This is Aragorn unmasked. Did I not openly proclaim my title before the doors of Edoras? Yes, I mean, you did. But there's a world of difference from proclaiming your title and divesting yourself of this shroud of ranger dumb, revealing yourself in your fullest measure, as, of course, Gandalf has done previously. You know, we've seen Glorfindel even. We've had glimpses. Remember Frodo had that glimpse of, of Glorfindel unmasked in, in this, this, this bright light in the world? So Aragorn has now done that. Um, let me see here. Uh, okay, we'll move through this in order. Nay, my friends, I am the lawful master of the stone, and I had both the right and the strength to use it, so or so I judged. He is the rightful master because he's the king. Remember, the stones were taken from Numenor by Elendo, by Isildur, when they fled the, the drowning of the continent of Numenor and came first to Middle-earth aboard their nine ships. Remember, we discussed that last time in the, uh, in the reading that, uh, in, in the quotation that Pippin made of the lore poem that Gandalf had uttered back at the end of The Two Towers. The right cannot be doubted. I am the king. That right is unassailable. The strength was enough, barely. And there we see a powerful point of intersection for Aragorn. I think there we see that combination of, of right and inherent authority, right? He is the king, as Jackie was pointing out earlier, right? Jackie was speculating earlier, and as I'm pretty happy to confirm, divinely appointed. Aragorn is just the king. That is not a question of his worth or his value. It is, it is a nature argument. It is innate to him that he be the king of Gondor, that he be the king of the reunited kingdom of Gondor and Arnor, that he be the descendant of Elendil, that he be the descendant of Isildur, that he be the hand that wields the sword that was broken and has now been reforged. That is innate to him. That is not a thing that he can be proud of, if that makes sense, right? It is not a choice or a task or a measure that is placed upon him. It is something that is simply true of Aragorn. To be Aragorn is to have this right. The strength, though, that is the test. That is the challenge that he rose to. The strength was enough, barely. It was a bitter struggle and the weariness is slow to pass. I spoke no word to him and in the end I wrenched the stone to my own will. In the end he claimed the stone from Sauron. He took the stone from Sauron's will. This thing that Gandalf was fearful of, this thing that Gandalf all but believed could not be done has now been done by Aragorn unmasked. That alone he will find hard to endure. And he beheld me. Yes, Master Gimli, he saw me, but in other guise than you see me here. He didn't see your buddy Aragorn. He didn't see... Strider, the ranger. He didn't see this road-worn and exhausted warrior from the north who has found himself now embroiled in the final conflict all the way in the south. He saw the king. He saw the bloodline of Elendil. He saw the bloodline of Isildur. He saw the bloodline of Numenor here resplendent again in his full glory. Aragorn uncloaked is what Sauron beheld. If that will aid him, then I have done ill, but I do not think so. To know that I lived and walked on the earth was a blow to his heart, I deem, for he knew it not till now. He didn't know that the, that the heir of Elendil was still out there. The eyes in Orthanc did not see through the armor of Theoden, but Sauron has not forgotten Isildur and the sword of Elendil. Now in this very hour of his grand designs, the heir of Isildur and the sword are revealed, for I showed the blade reforged to him. He did a little, you know, FaceTime thing with it. Ah, sword, sword, sword emoji, right? He showed him Narsil. He showed him Andro, Flame of the West. He showed him the sword that was broken and reforged. And when was the last time that Sauron saw that sword? Oh, right. Sauron saw that sword not just when it cut off his fingers, cut off his hand, cut off his arm, depending on your interpretation of the text there. But that was the moment when the ring passed from his possession into the possession of Isildur. By showing him the sword, he is effectively claiming the authority of the ring. This is one of the things that is driving Sauron now to act. He believes 
as we know from, from previous discussions, Sauron already believes that the forces in the West have the ring. He cannot conceive of a scheme to destroy it or even to hide it. He can only conceive of the, the desire to use it. The, he can only think in terms of the desire to make manifest his will, to, to wield the great, the immense power of the One Ring. And now he has every reason to believe that the One Ring is in the possession of the heir of the guy who took it in the first place. The guy who is the rightful king of this kingdom, and Sauron is too canny and wise to discount the power of, of, of that kingship there. And it is true, of course, that Sauron, uh, let's take a look at that. Uh, I, sh for, I showed the blade, reforged him. He is not so mighty yet that he is above fear, nay, doubt ever gnaws him. And as Gimli says, but he wields great dominion nonetheless, and now he will strike more swiftly. The hasty stroke goes oft astray, said Aragorn. We must press our enemy and no longer wait upon him for the move. So we must take action now because after mastering the stone, Aragorn managed to look south and behold the outlands, right? This is why the mustering of men in Gondor is is so much less impressive than we expected it to be. This is why the forces that have come to the aid of Gondor are far fewer in number than were expected, because right now the Corsairs are ravaging the river and the coast to the south. This is why so few men, relatively speaking, have marched to the aid of Gondor. And Aragorn knows about this. And, and without the aid of those troops, Gondor is going to fall 10 days. That's it. I, I give it 10 days tops, and then it's going to fall. But also... Aragorn is attracting the eye of the enemy. Now he has given Sauron a target. Now the eye of Sauron has finally managed to discern something important, something powerful, the most important, most powerful thing in the world, in fact. And all of Sauron's power and fury are going to be unleashed upon it. And in so doing, Aragorn is opening a pathway for Frodo and Sam. He is still holding on to the hope that the ring can be destroyed, that this power can be taken from the world and that Sauron can be conquered. Without that hope, there is no hope, right? There is no hope for Minas Tirith surviving this onslaught, right? Aragorn's argument here, a grave peril I saw coming and looked for upon Gondor from the south that will draw off great strength from the defense of Minas Tirith. If not countered swiftly, I deem the city will be lost ere 10 days be gone. And if we do counter it swiftly, then we might manage 12 days, 15 days, 20 days, 30 days even. Minas Tirith is not going to endure. It is not going to stand against the force of Mordor forever. It's not certainly going to win, but it can endure long enough that it can create this window for Frodo to accomplish what must be accomplished. Then lost it must be, said Gimli, for what help is there to send thither and how could it come in time? I have no help to send, therefore I must go myself. But there is only one way through the mountains that will bring me to the, co uh, the coastlines before all is lost. That is the path of the dead. The decision has been made and... It's just fantastic. I mean, it's just fantastic. The thought of Aragorn wrestling with the Palantir, of, of coming face to face with Sauron is, is just astonishing. Yeah, let me, uh, let me catch up here. Um, <laughs> Digital Janitor saying, who's got two thumbs and the sword that cut off your hand? This guy. That's <laughs> good. Good. Uh, Rachel says, drink every time the characters say Pods of the Dead. Um, don't, don't, don't do that. You, you'd never make it through the chapter alive. Yeah. Ryan says, I noticed that the movie version takes a lot of Aragorn's wisdom and puts it in Gandalf's words. The movie doesn't portray Aragorn as anything other than hero, in quotes, and I definitely like the character better with the complexity given in the book. I completely agree, Ryan. I completely agree. The depiction of Aragorn in The Return of the King in particular is kind of a swing and a miss. I know that I said this last time about, about uh, Faramir too. Like, there's a lot of stuff about Gondor that the Return of the King movie does not quite get right. I think the Return of the King movie pretty much triumphs with the Frodo and Sam story. I think it's pretty much a knockout adaptation of that story, but the Gondorian stuff doesn't really work. And we... Remember what I was just saying, right? Um, the right cannot be doubted. The strength was enough, barely. That's the essential conflict at the heart of Aragorn. It is not... Am I worthy? Am I really the king? Should I take up the sword? Is this my role? Is this what I am meant for? No, Aragorn doesn't have any of those doubts. He knows he's the king. He's known since he was 20 years old that he was the king. He's known since, since Elrond told him back at Rivendell that he was going to be the king. And then he went out in the world and became more kingly. Then he practiced his craft and became skilled in the ways of, of war and, and the many skills of the rangers too, I guess. Um, he knows that to be certain. The test for Aragorn is whether or not he can rise to the challenge. It's about his personal strength, not his nature. It is not a question of identity for Aragorn. It is a question of capability. And even in that, it's not just his capability, right? He's aware of the story of which he is a part. He's aware of the sweep of history and whether or not he can 
whether or not it is foreordained that he at this point will possess the strength to wrest the Palantir from Sauron and his influence, right? That's much less personal and much grander in scale. Aragorn in the movies is insecure. We don't like the very grandest scale of heroism and virtue in the movies. We just don't like it. So we take it away from Aragorn and we kind of twist Boromir a little bit too and we take it away from Faramir and none of those characters get the true depth and, and weight of, of heroism and of valor and of certainty that we see in the book. I'll take the book versions of those characters every time, particularly here in The Return of the King. I think that the Aragorn that we get I think Strider works pretty well, actually, in, in the Peter Jackson adaptations, but Aragorn, less so, less so. Yeah. Um, let me see as I catch up. Uh, Dry Heaving Llama saying, I like the movies, probably because I haven't read the books. No, I, I like the movies too, right? The movies are very, very good movies. The movies are very strong adaptations of the text. These are minor criticisms that um, that are really only problematic... <laughs> It is true, I suppose, of both Aragorn and of Faramir in the movie adaptations that we get at least a complete. So I'm, I'm thinking very carefully about how to say this, and I want to, I want to, you know, choose my words with care here. We get complete stories. It's not that movie Aragorn or movie Faramir are bad. Well, okay, movie Faramir is actually just pretty bad. Movie Aragorn is not bad. It's just a different story. It's just a very different story. So that character and that arc and that narrative hangs together really quite well. The problem is that it's not representative of the book. So I can enjoy it as a movie very much. I don't enjoy that particular element as an adaptation, which is frustrating only because there are many choices that Peter Jackson et al. make in the, the production of those films that I really do enjoy as adaptations of the original text. There are lots of things that, that I think are very strong and purposeful adaptations from the original text. So that's, that's the point of comparison. I, I think the movies are good, strong movies on their own terms. They are, generally speaking, very good and strong adaptations, too. Sometimes they falter a little bit, in, in both ways. But, yeah, we'll have lots of time to uh, to talk about that as we get there. Um, yeah, Jackie's saying, oh, he's not some insecure, coming-to-his-own, uncertain P hero PJ wanted. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the problem. Yes, good, good. Oh, and we're talking about the Battle of Pelennor Fields. We're talking about that moment of you catastrophe, right? Yes. Boy, we'll talk about that one. Well, actually, no, we're not going to talk about that when we get to it in the book, because in the book we're going to be consumed with what is a beautiful passage. Okay, let's move into, how much time do I have left? Let's move into the words of Malbeth the Seer and talk a little about the Paths of the Dead, I guess, and then we're going to uh, probably call it quits for this week before we get to Aragorn and Eowyn, which means we're going to have a heck of a reading next week. Let me tell you guys, it's going to be a fantastic wall-to-wall, -wall, nothing but hits, nothing but club bangers session next week. I'm looking forward to it already. Thus spoke Malbeth the seer, in the days of, Arvedu of Arvedui, last king at Fornos, said Aragorn. Over the land there lies a long shadow, westward reaching wings of darkness. The tower trembles. To the tombs of kings doom approaches. The dead awaken, for the hour has come for the oath-breakers. At the stone of Erech they shall stand again, and hear there a horn in the hills ringing. Who shall the horn be? Who shall call them from the grey twilight, the forgotten people? The heir of him to whom the oath they swore. From the north shall he come, need shall drive him, he shall pass the door to the paths of the dead. Dark ways, doubtless, said Gimli, but no darker than these staves are to me. If you would understand them better, then I bid you come with me, said Aragorn, for that way I now shall take, but I do not go gladly, only need drives me, therefore only of your free will would I have you come, for you will find both toil and great fear, and maybe worse. I will go with you, even on the paths of the dead, and to whatever end they may lead, said Gimli. I also will come, said Legolas for I do not fear the dead. So this is one of the two prophecies of Malbeth the Seer, previously of Fornost. Uh, Fornost is the um, great, or one of the great cities of, of Arnor, one of the great cities in Eriador. It's uh, in the North Downs, just or uh, was in the North Downs, just north of Bree. So this is absolutely a prophecy that has been passed down from the time of Arnor. This is an ancient prophecy. This is before the Dúnedain were the Dúnedain. This is when they still peopled the lands of Arnor before the uh, war with the Witch King of Angmar sent them into to, uh, into hiding in the north. Malbeth's name is Sindarin for the golden word. Mal meaning gold. You know, we've heard of that in terms of the Malorn trees, for example. And Peth becoming Beth, meaning word or voice. So the golden word of Malbeth the seer. Over the land there lies a long shadow westward reaching wings of darkness. Check. Check. 
The tower trembles to the tombs of kings, doom approaches, the dead awaken for the hour has come for the oath breakers. At the stone of Erech they shall stand again and hear there a horn in the hills ringing. We're going to talk about the actual reason that the dead, that the oath breakers are still in the ponds of the dead in just a bit because we're going to get Aragorn's explanation of it in just a moment. Whose shall the horn be? Who shall call them from the grey twilight, the forgotten people? These rhetorical questions will now be answered with the, the heir of him to whom the oath they swore. From the north shall he come, need shall drive him, he shall pass the door to the paths of the dead. And Aragorn echoing the words of the prophecy, right? This is not Aragorn being prophetic on his own terms. This is Aragorn being prophetic by distant, distant proxy here, because you'll note, uh, I do not go gladly, only need drives me. Echoing the, uh, from the north shall he come, need shall drive him. That doesn't seem to be conscious as Aragorn is, is reframing that particular phrase there. He seems to just be echoing it or almost, almost confirming the prophecy, right? Need shall drive him, need drives me. These are special and sacred words. This is the echo that has been heard across this gulf of time. This is the, uh, the, the truth of it. Yeah, yeah. Good. Oh, um, I'm seeing here in the chat that uh, Sanitar Claus is saying, I wish some Tolkien nerd with a billion dollars would make a totally faithful adaptation of the books into movies that is super long and not necessarily easy to watch. Yeah, you and me both. I mean, we kind of have the audiobook versions, which I guess get us some distance toward that. And I have big hopes for the Amazon original video series that uh, I am increasingly sure that the numbers associated with that series are just getting higher and higher and higher. So every time there is an update, Amazon's going to spend half a billion dollars on this series. Amazon's going to spend three quarters of a billion dollars on the series. Amazon is going to sell everything. And Jeff Bezos is personally going to finance every cent he has into the making of this Lord of the Rings TV series. The more I hear those stories, the more convinced I am that it's young Aragorn, the more convinced I am that we're going to get something that is super marketable, something that has name recognition attached, right? I, I think that's where we're going to go. Young Strider, possibly. I'm not sure we're going to call him Aragorn all the way through, but Young Strider, I could definitely see that story happening. And that's great, by the way. That is, that is fine by me. If that's the path that they take, I think that's the wisest adaptive choice that they could make, given the bounds that they have set themselves. I would love just a straight Lord of the Rings. I would love, do The Hobbit again, do The Hobbit better, right? Just just make that happen. Take two seasons to tell the story of The Hobbit. I'm, I'm in for that, right? Actually, that would be fantastic. If the climax at the end of the first season was out of the frying pan and into the fire as the hobbits, uh, as the Hobbit and the dwarves are plucked from the trees by the eagles, right? At the, at the, uh, uh, the, the eastern flank of the Misty Mountains there, that would be a fantastic season finale cliffhanger there as we move into Bjorn's house at the start of season two. You could definitely do that. I would love that, but they have confirmed that it is going to be uh, not touching any of the published material, uh, any of the previously adapted material, I suppose, and that it is going to be a prequel to the Lord of the Rings series. So... We'll see. We'll see. I'm hoping for, for young Aragorn and some, uh, some smart crossover there. Yeah, good. All right. Um, <laughs> excellent. Yeah, here's a bard saying, I would adore a young Aragorn series. Yes. Yes, me too. Me too. I think that could, that could be very good. Excellent. Uh, Estelle says Jackie. Yeah, they could definitely call it Estelle, right? I, I don't know that has quite the name recognition, but uh, I mean, if they're really leaning into the Tolkien influence there, they should just give all of the names, right? Estelle, who was called Strider, who was called Aragorn, right? Yeah. Heir of Elendil, Heir of Isildur. Yeah. Good. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's push on. We'll do the... Uh, Let's do, let's do uh, Aragorn's inspirational speech here. Let, let's give the moment when uh, Aragorn really raises his rhetoric once again, and then we'll wrap up for this week. This is to the stone of Erech. That we shall know if we come to Erech, said Aragorn. But the oath, that, the oath that they broke was to fight against Sauron, and they must fight therefore if they are to fulfill it. For at Erech there stands yet a black stone that was brought to descend from Numenor by Isildur, and it was set upon a hill, and upon it the king of the mountains swore allegiance to him in the beginning of the realm of Gondor. But when Sauron returned and grew in might again, Isildur summoned the men of the mountains to fulfill their oath, and they would not, for they had worshipped Sauron in the dark years. Then Isildur said to their king, Thou shalt be the last king, and if the West prove mightier than thy black master, this curse I lay upon thee and thy folk, to rest never until your oath is fulfilled, for this war will last through years uncounted, and you shall be summoned once again ere the end. And they fled before the wrath of Isildur, and did not dare to go forth on war, excuse me, did not get, dare to go forth to war on Sauron's part, and they hid themselves in secret places in the mountains, and had no dealings with other men, but slowly dwindled in the barren hills. And the terror of the sleepless dead lies about the hill of Erech, and all places where the people lingered. But that way I must go, since there are none living to help me. He stood up. Come, he cried, and drew his sword, and it flashed in the twilight hall of the burg. To the stone of Erech! I seek the paths of the dead! Come with me who will! Legolas and Gimli made no answer, but they rose and followed Aragorn from the hall. On the green there waited still and silent the hooded rangers. Legolas and Gimli mounted. Aragorn sprang upon Roharan. 
Then Halbarad lifted a great horn, and the blast of it echoed in Helm's Deep, and with that they leapt away, riding down the coom like thunder, while all the men that were left on dyke or berg stared in amaze. It's easy, I think, to be swept up by the tonality of this, by, by the, the resonance of this, by the heroic register of this, but there is just a little part of me, there is a part of me that has been schooled in postmodern hipster ironic television specifically, right? There is a part of me that has been schooled by the, the flat cutaway, I suppose is what we can term it, if you've ever seen you know, a TV show, particularly if you've ever seen like a modern sitcom, you are familiar with the flat cutaway where a character says something heroic or dramatic or brilliant or bombastic and we cut away to a completely blank expression a completely blank response and i can't help this is my flaw here i must admit i can't help but think of that every time i read this passage he stood up come he cried and drew his sword and it flashed in the twilight hall of the berg to the stone of eric i seek the paths of the dead come with me who will legolas and gimli made no answer like legolas and gimli give a jim halpert from the office take to camera they both kind of okay because they are the only ones there to whom is Aragorn giving this rousing speech? To whom is Aragorn speaking? It's just Legolas and Gimli. Well, and in part, I think, to Aragorn himself. And, in a sense, to the pages of history, I think. Right? He is kind of honoring his part in the prophetic movement of the story, I suppose, as we just saw in the previous slide, right? Uh, I, I have great need, like haste is, is necessary here, as he's echoing the words of the prophecy. We kind of get a sense of that too, as he's slipping into Isildur's higher register too. You'll know, So the register first, right? The, the, the tone of this uh, attributed dialogue here is pretty high. But the oath that they broke was to fight against Saruman and they must fight therefore if they are to fulfill it. But for at Eric, for at Eric, right? This This kind of, this this continuing resonant sweep of history, pseudo-biblical language, you'll remember in last week's reading, so Gandalf and Pippin wrote for it, right? It's that similar kind of, of register here. For at Eric there stands yet a black stone that was brought, it was said, from Numenor by Isildur, and it was set upon a hill, and upon it the king of the mountains swore allegiance to him in the beginning of the realm of Gondor. I suppose we should break down the narrative here just a little bit. Exactly that, right? Isildur, uh, shortly after the founding of Gondor, goes out to uh, goes out to the men of the mountains, to the king of the mountains, and asks for his aid, asks for his fealty, asks for his service and fellowship and alliance, and he brings with him this great titanic black stone that he puts at the top of the hill of Erech, and the king of the mountains comes down and swears upon it, swears fealty to Isildur, swears aid to Isildur. But then, when the time comes in the intervening years, when there has been no word of Sauron, the men of the mountains have actually started worshipping Sauron. They have crafted black temples. We're going to get in our reading as we move through the Paths of the Dead reference to uh, reference to the body that is found by the door. That is a door to a black temple to Sauron deep within the mountains there. And that is happening in the mountains throughout this period so that when Sauron comes again and Isildur says, hey, remember that promise you made? Let's go. Now's the time. They don't come. They fail to respond to their oath. They break their oath. They are the oath breakers. But that oath still binds them, even though they broke it. And Isildur lays the curse upon them. Thou shalt be the last king. And if the West prove mightier than the Black Master, the, than thy Black Master, this curse I lay upon thee and thy folk to rest never until your oath is fulfilled. For this war will last through years uncounted, and you shall be summoned once again ere the end. Another moment of prophecy there, but this moment of prophecy from Isildur, right? This feels very much like Aragorn's moments of prophecy. Aomer, I feel like we're going to meet again. I feel like we're going to come into battle again, though the hosts of Mordor stand between us. A moment of prophecy from Aragorn. And this feels like that same, that, that same tone, that same register here. This curse I lay upon thee and thy folk. I don't interpret that to be like an actual curse. I interpret that to be more prophetic. I don't think that, that Isildur is is cursing them in the traditional sense. I think that he is acknowledging something that is true, that it is the oath that binds the oath breakers in the paths of the dead, not Isildur's curse, if that makes sense. But that is certainly open to interpretation too, yeah. Um, so then, yes, he stood up. Come, he cried, and drew his sword, and it flashed in the twilight hall of the burg. He's ready. It's time to go. Oh, a note here. Um, Aragorn sprang upon Roharon. Roharon is the steed that the, uh, the, the Dúnedain brought with them from the north. It means the lady's steed. It means the lady's horse. You'll recognize the Ro prefix there from Rohan and a million names that we've discussed here in, in Rohan. Uh, Roharon, the lady's steed, that is because it is Arwen's horse. It is Arwen's gift to Aragorn at this point. That's why he's, uh, that's why he's got that. Then Halbrad lifted a great horn and the blast of it echoed in Helm's Deep. Remember 
Remember the prophecy? Remember the note about the horn there ringing in the mountains? Whose horn is it? Well, it's Habarad's horn, but it's not really Habarad's horn. It's Aragorn's horn. This is the coming of the king of the dead. We're going to get to all of that in next week's reading. Um, that, I think, is actually the perfect point to call it quits because we are going to... We're going to ride back to Edoras, we're going to get to Dunharrow, we're going to get to Eowyn, and then we're going to launch into some really brilliant readings. So um, I think we're going to call it quits there for this week. You guys, next week we will get to the rest of Chapter 2 and Chapter 3, The Muster of Rohan. Next week will be an afternoon session. That is going to be 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central on, let me double check the date, April 5th. Next Thursday, we'll be back to our Thursday schedule next week uh, on April the 5th. We've got just enough time for a question or two here. Um... Oh boy, Tom D. Meyer asking, how much of Gandalf's nature does Aragorn know all of it? Uh, this is kind of echoing the question that we had last time, at the end of last week's session, when we were talking about Gandalf's nature and who is aware of the fullest measure of that nature. Does Aragorn know Gandalf's nature? I don't think, in intuitively, I don't think that, that Aragorn would be able to put the names to it. I don't think that Aragorn would be able to sit down and say, well, he's a Maya. Um, they're immortal spirits from Valinor. I don't think that he would be able to put it in quite those terms. I don't think that he would be able to talk about the uh, the incarnation of the Astari into the physical bodies which they now possess, right? That's easy to lose track of, but, but Gandalf does possess a physical body. All of the wizards do. They all came into physical bodies when they came to Middle-earth. Gandalf died following the Battle of the Balrog. He was given, in the aftermath, a new body. That is that is how that whole exchange worked in the, in the broadest sweep of it, I suppose. Does Aragorn know? Aragorn would suspect, I imagine, um, not just the scale of Gandalf's power, but the source of Gandalf's power. And that's not just because he knows Gandalf personally very well, and not just because he has studied at Rivendell for so many years, not just because he is close to, you know, the greatest lore masters remaining in Middle-earth, but because he is the king, because he is of Numenorean descent, because he has that blood, because he has that ability to perceive, right? You remember this was attributed to Faramir too, uh, to, to those possessed of the blood of Numenor, right? Denethor has it, Faramir has it, Aragorn sure as hell has it. Aragorn has it in abundance. He has Numenorean blood, plus plus. Also, he's the king, plus plus plus, right? He's got all kinds of mad skills in that, in that particular arena. So I think, yes, I don't think that he would know like the proper nouns to attach to it, but uh, my read of it would be that he would be pretty... Pretty sure, although I suppose <laughs> Gandalf's power is also, Gandalf's power, Gandalf's nature, Gandalf's identity are also, from a certain perspective, just kind of unfathomable, right? We want to pin this stuff down in a way that I'm not sure Aragorn would want to pin it down. He, I'm not sure that Aragorn would want to define it in quite the way that we do, but that would be my read, certainly. Um, let me see here. Does Denethor know that it is a reasonable possibility that the king could return? Does he know that an heir exists somewhere? If so, was it not his job to seek him out? If not, does that excuse any aspect of his behavior? Denethor pretty clearly does not know that the king is returning, right? Denethor pretty clearly does not know that Aragorn is imminent. Um, not even that there is an heir in the world, but that there is no reason to believe that there is an heir in the world, first off, right? Uh, Denethor has no reason, you know, this isn't just lore waning in Gondor either. There is no reason to believe that there is still an heir of the line of Isildur in the world. I suppose, does it, I, I'm, I'm puzzled by this question, does it excuse his behavior? No, I don't think that it does. I don't think that it does. And I don't think that Faramir, for example, or Beragond, right? I don't think that other men of Gondor would believe that it would excuse his behavior. The fact that the king is never going to return does not mean that the power of the king defaults to the steward. It doesn't mean that there, that there is an opening there, right? It, you are either the king or you are not. This is not a position to which one might ascend. This is not a position that is open for applicants at this time. This is a, a true and innate and fundamental part of who you are in the world. So I don't think that it would excuse it, but it is true, I think, that Denethor isn't aware of the coming of the king. He isn't aware that the king is going to return. This is why Gandalf's playing with him, right? He, he's teasing him throughout their whole first exchange there in the Citadel as Pippin's taking his oath. There's some some playful, well, you know, if the king should ever come again, which if you hold now is likely, right? There's some some teasing going on there because Gandalf knows exactly how close Aragorn is and knows exactly how this is all going all gonna to go down in the end. Denethor should be a faithful steward in a way that he is not. And that jealousy, that, that, that envy more specifically, right? That desire for power. Well, that's classic, you know, corruption of man stuff. That's, that's what happens to man in middle earth. Yeah. 
Uh, James Broken here says, so does that mean the Gondorians don't really know about the nature of the Dunedain? Um, they may know that the Dunedain are the remnants of Arnor if they give any thought at all to the, to the Dunedain, right? Um, do they know that there are rangers still in the north? I'm trying to think of confirmation of that. Um, I mean, Boromir isn't astonished that there are other men in the world, right? He's not astonished that there are men in the north, and there are men still further in the north too. Descendants of Arnor? I don't know. I'm not entirely sure how the uh, how the lore would stand up in Gondor there, but certainly they don't know that, that yeah, Aragorn is among them and uh, is going to come back. Yeah, yeah, good. All right, that is going to do it, I think, you guys. This is... Uh, this is... This has been an absolute pleasure. I'm, I'm disappointed that we didn't get to talk about Arag Aragorn and uh, Eowyn this week. But next week, as I say, it is going to be a, a barnstormer of a session. I hope you will all be able to join me 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central next Thursday. That is April the 5th. I cannot believe that it is almost April already. And thank you so much for your patience, too, this week. I've been traveling around the last couple of days, so I wasn't sure that I would be able to make it back for last night's regular Thursday session. That's why we've moved it to Friday this week. But the podcast will go out, well, probably within the next couple of hours as normal. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you so much for your company. I will talk to you all again again next time. Until then, fly, you fools! Fly, you fools.